Assalamu alaikum everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Medical Talk. Today we have with us Dr. Arfa Masiuddin, who is currently doing her Master's in Health Policy Management from the Aga Khan University. She has also received the MHPM Scholarship from the Aga Khan University and is also the founder of the Society for Humanistic Medicine, where she talks about humanistic medicine, which is a very new concept for us and for a lot of people. And I am very excited to talk to her about this. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Arfa. Malikum salam, Mushay, and uh, thank you for having me here. I'm excited to talk about humanistic medicine now, finally. And thank you for getting my name right. I was confused if it's Arfa or Arfa. A lot of people get my name wrong as well. They call me Anusha for some reason, although my spelling is very clear. It's Anusha. I spent half my life people correct, correcting the pronunciation of my name. I think it's Arfa. <laughs> it's a very nice name it's a very different name as well I've heard Arfa a lot but Arfa is a different name we usually start by talking about early life and where were you born and raised and what was your early education like and so I am from Karachi yeah. and uh, I did my schooling from Springfield school and then I ha- I went to Beacon House for my A-levels and in A-levels I had um, English language instead of the GP paper the general paper that's usually there in English uh, for A-levels and uh, I think that played a big role in getting me to where I am, whether it was choosing public health or it was choosing to write. And as we go further along and when you'll ask me questions, so I think that choosing to have that paper were played a big role. Then I went to Zerati for my medical school and I did my medicine in 2019. Then in 2020, I did my house job. And 2020 was the COVID year. Yeah. 2020 was when COVID came to Pakistan. So that house job period was very, very terrifying. Not going to lie, very terrifying. And it's like, you know, um, so when I was in uh, third year, and that's when the clinical rotations, you know, they usually start. So um, given the kind of person I was always, I was always observing, you know, the little nitty gritties of the yeah. patient and the physician encounter and what's happening. And that's when I realized that there are so many loopholes, that the system is so full of flaws. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about you giving them a treatment plan or something. There is so much more that goes into it. So that's when my interest in public health also kind of began, right? So uh, when COVID happened and I was working as a house officer, the entire load was upon us and I was, you know, constantly, I I was one of those house officers who were always like, you you're not giving us the PPE. How do you expect us to go out there? So you know, I was that kind of person, and I whatever um you know uh, problems I had with the system, I would talk about. Yeah. So um and of course, COVID kind of brought out all the problems. You know, it was like a big mirror staring at your face. Whether it was about the health workforce being exhausted, or it was the uh, short we had resources, logistics, so many things that go behind. You know, it just came out. So that, again, further, you could say, solidified my decision, further made me, oh, made, made, made me decide that, okay, um, I was always, I always want to pursue family medicine, by the way. So I was like, no, maybe this is what I should be doing, you know, yeah. and um, that, that's a decision that comes from being aware of your own strengths and weaknesses. And uh, that was something I was very, you know, careful about. And I was like, that does not make me happy because the more I... I mean, service delivery that is in patient care, the more frustrated I get with the system because yeah. I'm like, this is not the kind of care I should be giving. Uh, yeah. This is the problem. That's, you know, so many things would come in between. Yes. So when my house was about to end, I came across this um, advertisement for a very cool health innovation. CCID stands for Critical Creative Innovative Thinking. Yeah. Uh, and it's a sub-department at the Aachen University, and it's chaired by Dr. Asad Mia, who is the chair of pediatric uh, emergency at AQ. Mm-hmm. So they were offering this health innovation fellowship. It was like a one-year fellowship, and you know they they train you on how to come up with solutions mm-hmm. for um, healthcare problems, and you know it was all about innovation. Now, and as you know, that innovation is a big word these days. So it just struck me as something very interesting and something that I was, you know, I was like that definitely sounds like something of my life yeah. and it was a big reason for my interest towards that fellowship was also because Dr. Asad was uh, a huge proponent of a huge supporter of narrative medicine yeah. so I, I know I'm throwing lots of new words at you yeah. so narrative medicine is like basically storytelling in medicine Yeah. and it seems like you don't know what it is but it's just like you know you're writing you're you're mm-hmm. just writing stories about your experience with the patients you're mm-hmm. writing stories of the patients you're writing your own about your own experiences in medicine mm-hmm. so 
in short, it's storytelling in medicine. Mm. And there's a there's a whole uh, master's course, the University of Columbia. You know, he used to write on it and I used to follow his blog. So, you know, that I knew that this is going to be something worthwhile. Mm. So I applied and then I got in and uh, immediately after my house job, I did this one year fellowship at AQ. Yeah. So while I was there, I got to rotate at the different departments there, look at the backhand of how things are running and everything. So while I was there, I was, you know, constantly weighing my options that lab, assembly, FCPS, or public. Finally, I decided that no, health policy management, which is like, um, you could say a subspecialty of public health, that's what I want to be doing. Because I, if I have a problem with something, think about it, or rather than just, uh, you know, uh, criticize just do something I am that like that's just how I am you know I'd rather not criticize I'd rather come up with a solution and do it and it was something I felt really you know very strongly about so hence that's how uh, the masters happened and I applied and uh, I just applied and uh, alhamdulillah it happened and it's it's a two years master's course and um, master's degree and uh, I'm done with one year, almost one and a half now. I'm in my third semester and I, hopefully, hopefully I'll graduate in December this year. That 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 was my journey up till now. Yeah, that's amazing. Academic journey, you could say. That's amazing. I feel like the thing you mentioned about going in third year and realizing that there's so many problems with the healthcare system rather than complaining, it's really nice that you took the initiative and wanted to do something about it. You know, one thing I realized was that uh, nobody else, and I mean, it's not something I realized, just something I had to tell myself again and again was that nobody is going to come and live my life for me. Uh -huh. So, you know, they might suggest, okay, okay, your assembly is the way to go, plap is the way yeah. to go, but at the end of the day, those people are not the ones experiencing what I'm experiencing. They're not the people who will see or do what I get to do. And you get one life and you should do that. The work should not be something that you're like, you know, oh, I hate doing it. That is yeah. the worst part of it all. In healthcare, you yeah. ought to enjoy what you're doing because if you don't, that ends up, that creates a very um, negative ripple effect that harms not only the patients, but your own health and also that of your own families. That is one aspect of healthcare that mm -hmm. nobody talks about. How the families and the, how the friends of the healthcare providers, how do they suffer? How do they put up with that? So it was very important for me to be doing something that I genuinely enjoyed doing. And my personal motto was always like, you know, don't do anything unless I'm fully invested into it. Your assembly in lab was something that I figured out that I saw all my friends going for it. And the challenges that came and, you know, it was like I first had experienced all of that, like mm -hmm. oh, get through that. And I decided that, no, that's not really the thing for me. That's not what I see myself doing. That's not what I enjoy. So, you know, I feel like every time we're making a decision, especially about our careers, whether it's choosing your specialty, ke, general medicine, karni hai, surgery, karni hai, peeps, karni, whatever, you need to also take into consideration your own strengths and weaknesses. You need to be very, like, you really need to think and sit yeah. and think what, what thing you're going to pick. You just can't, like, I'm it's very difficult to come out of that peer pressure where everyone is talking about PLAB with family, the specialty they want to do. I was talking to some of my friends the other day and they said that we are really interested in public health and the administrative side of hospitals or medicine. And I obviously that's a very important side. Without this, hospitals won't be able to work. Absolutely. I agree. Absolutely. What has your experience been like in public health? So it's it's been really fun. <laughs> Every university has its own pros and cons yeah. and there are problems, especially when you start like these days, we're just stuck in that brought for a thesis getting approvals yeah. and all of those things so it, it's there but for me personally speaking it was it's been a good experience so far um and a good experience also because not just I feel like I had a personal interest in it but also because when I had applied I came with a plan yeah. um it wasn't just that oh so basically I, I, I always explain HPM to people is that so you have internal medicine, for example. Yes. That's like a big specialty. Internal medicine can be subspecialties. So in the public health, mein you have epidemiology and biostats. You have health policy management. So for me, health policy and management was something that I felt strongly about because uh, when, like I told you, when I was in, uh, when I was doing my house job, um, I was observing and picking up on a lot of problems, a lot of organizational problems, a lot of problems in the system that were there. Yeah. And I felt like I uh, 
talk about how we should be delivering compassionate care. Yeah. That is what humanistic medicine is, and we'll come to that. Yeah. But that's what I'm talking about. But how can we be expected to deliver that compassionate care in a system that is so broken, in a system that is so flawed, in a system that is not supported? Hmm. You see, how do we do it? So that's when I figured that, okay, there has to be something. The system needs to change. Yes. But you can't just go up and rip apart the policies and the system. No, it, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. So it was just this vision that I had in my mind. So when I, and that's what I took ahead to my master's, that I knew that what I'm going to take out of this is that find a way to come up with a health policy or a system or come up with a uh, come up with an idea so that we can deliver more compassionate care yeah. as healthcare providers we can strengthen the system mm -hmm. patient safety quality management quality control and health systems that's what i wanted to focus on so i feel like maybe that is one reason why i feel more satisfied with mm -hmm. what i'm doing right now in the degree because every time i sit in my class um I, that's what I, I'm applying what I had in mind, the idea that I had. It's easy for me to see, okay, iske baad ye kar sakte this is how I'm going to pick that up. Yeah. So very interestingly enough, like that is also why, in fact, when I wasn't during in my house job only, I started this uh, online virtual community called International Society of Humanistic Medicine, which has now become International Community of Humanistic yeah. Medicine. So I started it because I knew I wanted to do something and I do feel passionately about it, but I didn't have the knowledge. I didn't have the tools. I did not know what to do about it, right? If you had come to me saying that I have fever, diarrhea, cough, fever, I had started that. But I didn't know how to fix the system. I didn't know how to deal with the health policies. Mm -hmm. All I knew was that this problem hai. If mm -hmm. a patient comes in and says that the doctor is not giving me enough time, the doctor is not listening to me, then as a healthcare provider, I also know that there are 50, there are 50 other uh, patients lined up outside my OPD. I don't have time. I don't have resources. I have to see this patient within span yeah. of 10 minutes only. Yeah. So I understand the other side of the story also as a healthcare provider. So I was like, so which is why when I started my degree, I was like, I know what I want out of this. So I came with that plan. And uh, other than that, we have a great faculty here, and uh, they're they're amazing. They're very they they're all subject like they're all experts in their subjects, yeah. and I have great friends here yeah. who make it very home. And uh, so yeah, I think that kind of sums it up. Our classes are basically in the afternoon. Yes. So uh, it's like, uh, and it's also uh, now that we're talking about the degree and people are also interested in public health. So let me just tell them that this is designed specifically for working professionals. Okay. So um, my class fellows are ER physicians, come from all walks of life. Mm -hmm. So because the classes are held in the afternoon, like mm -hmm. two to five or three to six, as the timings are there. Mm -hmm. And the examination system is also like, you know, you have quizzes, presentations, group work paper submissions, all of that. So it's it's fun that way. It's fun that way and it's definitely doable for somebody who is already working. So if there's someone who's working and they're like, how can I do this side by side? So you definitely can. Courses are also designed in such a way that, um, of course, there's always room for improvement, but uh, all of them are, of course, very relevant to policy making and management and what mm -hmm. each of us can come out of it. I always believe that no education never goes to be. Never how you decide to make use of that. Mm -hmm. So if you're coming in with an aim in mind, if you have some goals in your mind, and you know that this is what I want to get out of this, and it becomes mm -hmm. really easy for you to kind of implement it. And then you kind of, you also enjoy what you're doing. So, and even though I did not like community health science CHS back then, you know, oh, in med schools. I think in med school, no one likes CHS. For no one likes CHS. <laughs> I, I really enjoy sitting through the classes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think the best thing is that you didn't walk into it blindly. You had a purpose behind it. You had a reason and a vision behind this degree. That's quite true. Doing your due diligence and research before you step into it is always a good idea. Yeah. Looking at the job market, looking at the opportunities that you have there, and most importantly, figuring out what you really want to be doing. So, and that, of course, doesn't come to us when we're, you know, in yeah. C-levels, O-levels, intermediate. You know, there's no mentorship at all. There's nobody to tell you the real state. Nobody tells you, okay, you have to decide between FCPS and PLAB and USMLE. Yeah. Nobody tells you, okay, in each pathway, iski ye cost lagegi, iske liye aapko itne, you have, these are these yeah. many exams you have to give, these many certifications you need to have. Nobody tells you these things. Yeah. Some people, they come into medicine and they don't even know because obviously you were just 18, 19 back then. They don't even know that you have to do something after MBBS. Yes.
what is the job market like for this degree and for public health in general in Pakistan? There are a lot of employment opportunities within Pakistan also and of course abroad also. You need to look in the right places, I would say. You can't, it's, it's not the kind of job that newspaper advertisements are yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, especially because public health is a very it's relatively new in Pakistan mm-hmm. and even the world over I would say public health was always there post in the post in the post COVID world its importance to is other highlight over here because then you realize why preventive medicine or why public health in general and all of these things are so important. So, uh, uh, people who graduate from public health degrees you can there you can work in the uh, private sector. You can work in the public sector, you can work in public private in the development sector. Uh, you get to work with a lot of NGOs and there are WHO, UNICEF, uh, you know, you, you can work there. Then there are a lot of other, uh, you know, international donor agencies that you can work with all who are working towards uh, health, you know, in, in healthcare, you know, promoting and delivering a universal health coverage. The opportunities are there, you just need to be looking and the how to look about that, I always say LinkedIn yeah it's, it's just a tool it's just a platform yeah. that's there just like facebook so you make use of that you know and it's, 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 everything has become so easy now you just type in the keywords public health and all this so you get a lot of those uh, opportunities and there are a lot of people out there now we have a lot of new healthcare companies so you get opportunities there if not in the field work then there's of course academia you know you get to pursue a phd you can work as a lecturer somewhere uh, mm-hmm. You start off with a re- research associate job, then you take on uh, uh, as a research specialist and then, you know, lecture and whatever. You publish papers, you go into academia and that's what you want to do. You teach. That's also very rewarding if that's what you like to do. So um, the opportunities are there. Like I say, you just need to be looking in the right places and um, what our seniors and uh, teachers ought to be doing is that uh, pave, pave the way for the future, the younger generation, guide them, tell them that these are the opportunities. Also, we need to really get out of our comfort zones. You know, we we feel like, oh, no, we have this job in this nice place. No, when you step out of it. You need to venture out. You will learn so much and you never know what opportunity, you know, just comes your way. And that's how you you really need to go looking for it that way. You know, it's not uh, it, like for residencies, kya hota hai, kya apne har, in Pakistan, at least, let's just, if you're keeping it in the Pakistani context, you have to take their test and there's an interview and, you know, you go and get a job. Like, that's as simple as that. But for public health, you really need to go and look in these places. Mm-hmm. So the best way to do that is ke, um, just look up people on LinkedIn, public health, just type mm-hmm. in the keywords. A lot of people will come up. When you go to their profiles, you see what jobs they've been at. So yeah. then you know, okay, okay, this is the kind of job description that would fit my qualifications and uh, what would f- it would fit the kind of work I want to do. Then you obviously you go on to the, the company's website and you just turn the job alert or, or something. Yeah. And then you go, I mean, that's how it happens. You you'd really need to go to the websites of all these places and yeah. um, have a look at them and the people, most importantly, the people. You think networking, plays a big role uh, here again you need to network you need to work hard you need to come up with ideas and when you put yourself out there and you're working hard and the opportunities will your ideas get recognized your work gets recognized yeah. so for anybody um and, and that's what i always tell my fellows also and colleagues and friends and everyone that when you're looking for a job in public health don't just be like, oh, I, I'm looking for a job. No, mm-hmm. know what you want, the kind of people who are there. Like, for example, if you have a mentor, if you have someone you look up to really, for example, mm-hmm. this person who is working in this is free. Then you go, you see what work they have done. How did they get to that place? Just follow them. The map is there for you. The best thing that I've discovered after coming into med school is LinkedIn. LinkedIn has endless opportunities, endless networking opportunities. You message someone on LinkedIn, they will reply. Even if they don't, you message someone else. I think personal branding is also very important nowadays. Very, that's, I think that's, you hit the nail on the head. That's, that's yeah. very important. So if I'm doing it, I'm saying something that makes sense. People are going to listen. If they're associated with something, this is also authentic this also holds true so definitely personal branding this is the age of technology and i feel like there's no point in turning away from it i mean we always uh tell our elders that oh you know you should adapt to the latest technology you should adapt times are changing but are we also changing i mean you you look at teens now and then you feel like there's a whole generation apart from us But honestly speaking, we also, even our generation, we need to adapt as well. We need to pick up these things as well and get out of our comfort zones. 
when we're talking about the MHPM program, you also have a scholarship. So what is the process of getting this scholarship? So, um, okay, AQ does have a lot and they, you know, they keep coming and usually they are in like certain fields. My scholarship did not really happen that way. It was, I think it was really, honestly, Alamia being very kind. Um, so AQ has this uh, student loan policy. You know, it's like when you apply, you have to give in certain admission fee and everything. And after that, if you apply for a student loan, then there's, you know, there's like a whole process because they're going to be documented documentation and you have to submit stuff like it is with any organization. Mm -hmm. So they don't turn away anybody because they can't pay or something like that. So uh, to anybody who's ever who's wondering and who wants to apply, just go ahead, apply. You will get in if you deserve to get in. The yeah. admission is purely based on on merit so uh you know i had only applied for a student loan and i had submitted my cv along with it and everything uh so what happens is that sometimes uh they have these internal scholarships own specific criteria that maybe we will we will give a scholarship to somebody who has this gpa or somebody who has a very um novel idea for a thesis or something like that so that's just how mine happened. I, uh, like, you know, you said that you, you're on LinkedIn. So yes, I've been very vocal about humanistic medicine and narrative medicine, one of those things. So um, this was an idea that appealed to the scholarship body that this is something very different. And so they just uh, decided to give me a scholarship based on that. So it was honestly more like a surprise. On one fine April, I get this email that you've been awarded in scholarship. And I was like, but I applied for a student loan. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I apply for but I'm gonna say no to Alamia's blessings yes. so extremely grateful for that but yes so you know that's 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 one thing when you're coming in you come in with a plan and you have if you have a unique idea you have a novel idea mm -hmm. and if you're deserving then the doors are open so like there's another friend of mine who got us got another scholarship yeah. but she got it in reproductive health these days reproductive health climate change these are very hot topics so if you have an interest in that and you decide that my thesis is going to be based on that then you can and you can get scholarships with there so there then these scholarships and then again the student loans that you know the university gives and then you can pay it back you know at your own pace mm -hmm. so it's very convenient that way for everybody that's really nice to hear because a lot of people, they want to do these degrees, but obviously they're very worried about the financial aspect. That's because it's very convenient to pay back in your own time. For someone who is thinking about a career in public health or going for a master's program in public health, what do you think their thought process should be? So I think the first thing you need to get out of your own mental roadblocks first, yeah. first of all. And why am I saying that is because uh, you're... Um, so in our society, uh, there's this very, there's this misconception that you're, you're a doctor if you're basic sciences teachers are not considered doctors. Public health specialists are not considered doctors. And my question to everybody who's, who says that or who believes that is that if the, where would you take the patient, where the, where the physician would see? Yeah. The hospital is a building. It's a system. It's running on certain principles. Who is making it run? right the whole healthcare system i mean how would it be possible if it was not for public health people if it wasn't for the public health specialists who are coming up with policies who are coming up with guidelines who are facilitating all of this yes. if it wasn't for the professors of basic sciences who would be making these doctors who would be teaching them yeah so you can't do that so you know it's it's, it's um, we have these certain standards said mm -hmm. that oh my god this is amazing this is just how it has to be this is glorious Every, everybody is important in its own place. It's like the whole ecosystem. You can't say that um, a river is not as important as the sea. I mean, come on. We know how, how the universe has been created in such a way that there is balance in everything. And each thing, even if it's like a small cockroach or a lizard or a crocodile, but they have their own, you know, yeah, role they have their own role to play. Yeah. I think that is a very weird example to give. No, no, I, I, it makes sense. Right yeah. now to make people understand how necessary yeah. it is and how important public health is. Whole healthcare system that is running, it's it's not as easy. There are building blocks to it, you know. So many things that go behind and each one of them requires policy to make. So mm -hmm. things first get this out of your mind, and if I do this, my mm -hmm. friends will judge me this and that. But honestly, 10 years down the lane, graduated, only a few of them are going to be fine. As unfortunate as it is, that's mm -hmm. the truth. So stop thinking about these people. Those people there are not paying your bills, they're not paying your university fee, they are not doing in the end, it's just going to be you. But at the end of the day, when you go to bed, you do so with the 
care conscience and you do so knowing that you made a difference in whatever way. When I was deciding to, you know, opt for public health, a lot of people were like, but you're not going to be a real doctor. You enjoy patients in patient interaction so much. My mind was like, okay, if I am a doctor, I'm going to be seeing maybe 30 patients in one day. I'm helping 30 people. But if I am actually able to, you know, deliver on my idea of humanistic medicine and strengthen the policies and the health system in the way that I want to, then I will be making the system better for a million doctors. Yeah. Each one of these doctors, the patients one day, imagine the impact it's going to have. Yeah. That was my idea. It's, it's kind, it's the perspective that you bring in, you know. For you, the glasses are the half full or it's half empty. Yeah. But it's true. So that's what this refers to. Get that out of your mind. Explore your options. Mm -hmm. When you're doing observerships, everybody does clinical observations. Do some research work also. Get, I know CHS departments are always such that nobody wants to get involved in that. But find, find your passion. If you feel like you're very interested in cardiology, maybe look up some research work that's related to clinical trials and cardiology. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in psychiatry, look up some research opportunities there. People are, the, the, the academics that are out there, they're just waiting for you to you know, talk to your professors, get involved in any in any kind of research work. There are a lot of companies now here that talk about, uh, you know, that are offering research modules. Mm -hmm. The only one right now that I can think of is Taurus Research because my friend runs it. But, you know, they offer modules on research and how to conduct research and all those. And there, But there's so many other people also who will train you and who will guide you. So, you know, once you get the hang of it, do a course on Coursera. Coursera. Yeah. These things, the world, the Google is your friend, you know, and as it's from authentic sources, just do it. Get involved in virtual courses, YouTube things, look up, build up your knowledge base. So, you know, that will expose you to different things. That will get you to realize, okay, this is what I like, this is what I not like. If you get into research, only if the math part of research is daunting, that's not it. You can always hire somebody to do the biostats for you the literature review writing and all of that could be your idea you know you don't necessarily have to go towards quantitative research you can do qualitative as well there are a lot of things like those that you can do so once you figured that out and you talk to people then you realize okay then you need to again pick and choose okay what is it that i would enjoy doing yeah. and also your personal values yeah. that was a very big factor that pushed me towards uh public health because i'm not saying that public health me corruption nahi hoti, public health me kuch kharab nahi hota. it's just that when i was doing the clinic when i was uh you know in clinical medicine yeah. there were a lot of things happening that i was not comfortable doing when it came to patient care ethical issues with that yeah. and i was like i cannot uh stand doing that for the next five yeah. six years of residency mm -hmm. the kind of life the residents go through whether it's pakistan or anywhere in the world it, it's definitely tough it's very right. tough mm -hmm. now and that's not going to be making me happy if i'm going if i deliberately have to put a patient through a procedure that could have been avoided or if i deliberately have to order certain tests or give a patient a medicine just because you know peaches and made up well, you have to decide that also what is it that you're comfortable doing what is not it's what is your cup of tea you really need to figure that out and the only way to do that is to talk to people go out get out of your comfort zone network learn from their experiences don't impose we're all learning we're always going to be learning so don't go with the you know with a with a very set idea okay but yes there can be more than one way one way to do a thing just like two plus two is four, so it's three plus one. Mm -hmm. Just have to figure out which one suits you best. Yeah. So you know, it was, it was certainty. So you go into public, you you go like you. That's how you choose. Again, yeah. peer pressure. You could either be like, oh, my friends are going to judge me, or you could be like, oh, I'm doing something new from all my friends. Mm -hmm. So you have to tell yourself if you are confident about it. Trust me, nobody else is going. People will stop eventually. I mean, I've been very lucky in the sense that nobody, none of my friends, at least, did that. I did hear this from uh, other people who were like, "Oh, you're a doctor, but you have done this." So I always heard it from them, but I was very careful about who to answer and who to not. So just don't worry about it. So once you figure that out, what to do, what not, again, also depending upon where you are financially. Mm -hmm. if you can afford to uh try assembly or lab or fcps can those things also need to be taken into account most importantly your family how mm -hmm. supportive are they going to be does your family structure allow you to sit uh in your room for eight hours at a stretch and do your u.s assembly blocks you know those are things you need to decide but you need to decide knowing that you're not going that you are responsible for them and years down the line you won't be resenting anybody else for that okay, oh my dad forced me to go into cardiology or Please don't do that. Don't pick up something just because somebody told you to do that. Because then, you know, when your heart is not in it, 
you're not going to yeah. get into it. If you're doing it only because, oh, it sounds fancy, yeah, mm -hmm. it won't happen. It just won't manifest itself that way. Yeah. So you have to be very clear about uh, your health, your mm -hmm. finances, your family support, where you are at that point in life, how emotionally healthy or emotionally resilient you feel yourself to be because it's not easy. Uh, getting through the one exam after another, the uncertainty of it all, uh, match hoga ya nahi hoga, is saal match no agle saal. Mm. It ruins friendships, ruins relationships, and it's not worth it at the end of the day. You have to be very, very thoughtful about these uh, all of these things. Mm. The med school is the best time for you to figure out, experiment, and see and try out new things. Just like you would try out a new restaurant, you would want to try out new experiences. You yeah. should be in your professional life also doing that again make use of linkedin connect with people talk to them see how their experience was and then you finally decide when you're done final year when you've done your house job the reason i, I even though i was interested in public health since a third year i decide i still did my house job because it gave me the kind of exposure and experience yeah. that otherwise i wouldn't have had yeah. i definitely would not have been able to do justice to my public health degree if i did not have that clinical experience either so you know uh, people are always like why do you have to uh what, medicine is not a product mm. that you're delivering medicine yeah. is a whole system it's yes. actors and actions in which so many people come into play from doctors, nurses, pharmacists, physiotherapists, lab technicians, patients, patients, families, doctors and their families also. Mm -hmm. A lot of things come into play. So the whole system is And mm -hmm. you cannot do that even at one loop. And this is why our system is completely disintegrated right now. Oh, that's what, those are the kind of things that you need to look at and then decide, Ke, achha, mujhe kya karna. and once you decide, then just work hard. There is no substitute in the world for working hard. Work hard and work smart. There is an easier, smarter way to do things, then definitely go about it. Do that. Be And most of all, just, just be open to ideas. Be open yeah. to talking to people. Don't just take innovation as another buzzword. Mm. Don't take, you know, it's like, oh, it's a cool word, so I'm going to talk about it. No, but what do you mean by it? What does it mean to you? How can you implement on it? So, you know, those, those kind of things are what I would tell everybody to just consider at this point in life, mm -hmm. all medics, that the world is full of possibilities, even mm -hmm. for a medical graduate. There are so many new things that are coming up in medicine now. Just explore them. And what my personal belief is that, uh, you know, uh, your and, and this is my personal belief as yeah. uh, a risk is written and it's going to come to you no matter yeah. from where. Yeah. If you're a Muslim, Hindu, Christian, no matter which religion you belong to, your risk is written. It's written where your provision is written. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about that. Well, that will come to you. You just have to figure out how to get there mm -hmm. and why and how to get there means really or how how sad you're going to be while you get there. You can either cry about it and get there or you can make the most out of it. Yeah. Make the most turn or turn a misfortune into a good opportunity and then you can move ahead with it. I think that's great advice and I'm sure that a lot of people will find this very helpful. I think I personally find it very helpful because it's very easy to be in that race where you're just influenced by what everyone else is doing. But at the end of the day, you are going to live your own life. What is going to make you happy personally? Considering what your family dynamics are like is also very important because that also plays a very important role where you want to live. Where do you want to live in Pakistan, the US, the UK, Middle East? There are a lot of things to consider. Very, very, if you're very, you're, you're very lucky if your family is very supported like mine was they never questioned me even though they, like my dad still doesn't get what i'm doing in health policy and management and i have to explain it to him again and again but he's like okay but sensibly karaoke if you survive with this <laughs> i'm sure it is so you know that that kind of support yeah. and unconditional faith kind of really matters so just look at and yeah so again med students build up a good support system yeah. and by when you when i say build up a good support system that doesn't mean just keep taking also yeah. give give free yeah. When you give, whether it's just a kind word, a piece of advice or helping someone, definitely going to come back to you. Whether or not it's to that person isn't necessary, but it is. You know, we, we're a clan. No other doctor will understand a doctor as much as you will. Yeah. Only you will know what your other doctor friend is going through. So just be there for each other. Build that support system. Invest in that support system and then be there for them also so that they're there for you too. It's important that whoever is at the administrative side also is a doctor and has that, yeah. that you know, that knowledge and that experience. Because you see, it was because I was in clinical practice that I know what the problems, the challenges being faced by the doctors are and what are those of the patients and their families.
if you're not empathetic enough, how are you going to know what the other person is feeling? If I was just an admin comes in, they're having a lot of nakhre kare, wait nahi karna unko, because I have that, I understand exactly what's happening. And so that, you know, those five years of med school don't go to waste because they give you perspective. They give you that position to be able to empathize and they give you that knowledge and that background for you to know, okay, if I'm making a health policy, this policy best because this needs to happen and this is the, in the best interests of the patient. This is how frequently guidelines change or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very important. You know, it's not just that you give them a job and something yeah. like that. No, you need to come from that place. You need to have that knowledge. And I'm not saying that a non-medical person cannot make a good, you cannot be a good policy maker or something. I'm sure. But somebody who has that background, they're the best people. They're the they're the ones suited to do that. So if you're thinking that five med school, karke public health, mein aake apni wo zaya kar di, so no, that that is an added bonus. That is what is enabling you to do that. Yeah, definitely. To be a public health professional. We need more people in public health and administrative side of medicine so that the healthcare system of Pakistan, what we are usually talking about, whenever we have a conversation about politics, the healthcare system always comes up, but we never really talk about how to change it. So I think it's very important for doctors who are talented like yourself to come in public health and change the kind of system that we have in Pakistan, inshallah. inshallah. You also founded the society called the International Community of Humanistic Medicine. What is that and what was the thought behind this and what exactly is humanistic medicine so let's start this way you go into a, or anybody goes into a clinic a hospital yeah. they uh have paid hefty fee for the doctor and they get into the conversation mm-hmm. and the doctor is very rude and dismissive you come home and you're like what was that yeah. They didn't ask me anything about it they just said and then it's fine mm-hmm. i'll give you another example and a very, a very old patient, uh, multiple comorbids, yeah. and they're about they're, they're they're not doing well. The prognosis is not good, and the doctor just goes up to the family and goes like, hey, aapne, you can take your patient home. Uh, um, just just pray it's in God's hand. Now we can't do anything. They're about to die. This all of this is just medicine. Humanistic medicine is when the patient comes in and they're stressed. They have a million questions to ask, and even if you don't have time to answer all of those questions. You smile at them, yeah. you console, you give them support, you offer them emotional support and you tell them that I am here, we will help you, whatever questions you have, we will answer them. And, you know, okay, you get a nurse or a medical student or somebody to help you counsel that patient if you don't have that, money, but you're kind to them, mm-hmm. kindness, compassion. Mm-hmm. Similarly, that example I gave you about this old patient dying. Yeah. Is, is that how you really go and tell somebody is that how you break a bad news or you tell the family and we and you're like hey, i'm very sorry yeah. to be saying this but uh their condition is not good yeah. and this is this is this is the prognosis and we're here with you every step of the way if you need anything at all please let us know if there is any way we can help you keep mm-hmm. your patient comfortable please let us know because we are doing our best to keep that mm-hmm. it's all all it takes is just one kind word a smile you know, a reassurance. And that is it. That is for humanistic medicine. Yeah. And the sad part is that I feel like medicine is supposed to be like that. You're dealing with life and death, but yeah. it's not like that. Yeah. It's not compassionate. You and I, we don't see that kind of compassionate yeah. medicine. And and how, when, whenever, like, when somebody comes back from the hospital, from a doctor's visit, the only time I hear them say, oh, you are a good doctor, hai, is when they say, oh, you always heard the word nice, they're kind, yeah. you know, they're compassion. So that is the difference. When we're talking about this, we get three terms, you know, sympathy, empathy, compassion. Sympathy is when you just feel sorry for someone. Oh, poor patient has cancer. Mm. Empathy, you understand their emotions. Mm. Oh, I wonder how they must be struggling with their diagnosis and what's going to happen. I'm, I'm so sorry. They must be feeling so scared. Compassion is when you act upon it to make their lives easy. When you want to support them, how can I make that cancer patient's life easy? I can offer them emotional support. I can offer them support groups. I can connect them with maybe somebody who offers a better uh, treatment package so that it's not actually about that is compassion and that is what humanistic medicine is about so humanistic medicine was a community i started when i was in doing my house job and it was because i saw how 
completely not compassionate medicine was how yeah. it was practiced. And I felt like that completely goes against the spirit of medicine. Yeah. So the the whole the, the entire thought idea, the entire idea behind it was to have a platform where we can engage in dialogue, we can share our experiences mm -hmm. and talk about the problems that prevent us from practicing medicine of that kind. See, yeah. the goals of humanistic medicine are basically focused on what the goal of it is to achieve that goal and the values underlying that, yeah. that, that process of wanting to achieve that. Mm. And again, here the different stakeholders come. I'm using the word stakeholder again because I come from a public health background. What I meant by stakeholder is that, like I said before, medicine is not a product or a service you're delivering. Yeah. It's a whole community. It's, it's yeah. an ecosystem of factors mm -hmm. and actions. And it's made everybody is involved. Everyone mm. from doctors, patients, nurses, caregivers, families of the doctors, all are involved. How do you empower them? Mm. How is it now? If I'm talking rudely to a patient, why is that? Because I'm overburdened. I'm experiencing vocational burnout. I haven't slept in 36 hours. I haven't even had time to have a sip of water. Yeah. I'm frustrated. My pay is not that well yeah. as a doctor or as a resident. What do you do? This is why you are, if I have so many thoughts, so many mm -hmm. negative thoughts and energy, I don't think anyone would expect me to talk to someone else nicely. I remember this one incident when I was doing my gynecology uh, rotation during my house job. One resident comes in and we were sitting in the room and we were I was filling in the endless document. And she she had a breakdown and she said this sentence and she was like, I feel That's what she said. And she left. I was shocked. I was like, what, what, what is she saying? Then the consultant was sitting there and asked her, what did she mean? Then she told me that her kids are very young. One is like eight months old and another one was like two years old or something. And it was the peak of COVID and he was like, she can't meet them. Her kids are at home with their grandmother and she is here. And that's what she said, that my first duty was to them. And I'm going to leave them here. Our concept is that if you're coming into healthcare, then it means that you are doing it out of charity. It doesn't have to be that way. You yeah. don't welfare, yes. I'm, talk I'm the person, I'm I'm really talking about being compassionate and humanity and all of that, but that doesn't mean you do it at the cost of your own basic right. And in your own basic right, it comes things like health, food, water, all of those things. Yeah. So you can't do that. I mean, if there is a way for you to be able to do both of them, why not? The things that we hear from our seniors is that, oh, we had it tougher than you. We used to sleep in the cars. We, mm. we wouldn't even have food. Okay, put up. But why? Why not make things better? Would you be doing the same for your children? That's my question to them. All parents want to give their kids a better life. So why not give your juniors a better life also? Why not facilitate things for them? Why not break that generational trauma? Why not break that, that cycle? That was the whole concept. I wanted a platform where we can talk about those things. Everybody gives it, okay, this is the problem I'm facing. This is the challenge I'm facing. And then together we brainstorm about how we can come up with cost-effective, sustainable solutions towards them. But like I told you, at that time, I was clueless. All I was doing was just sharing narrative medicine pieces and something. It was, it's now that now I have the tools and I have the knowledge and I know how to go about it. And I know what, how policies are made, how a system runs, that I have a fair idea of how to take it, take it up forward. You cannot expect, the, the approach doesn't have to be coming from the individual. It has to be a systems based approach, an outcomes oriented approach. Mm -hmm. That you're looking at the whole system, you have to strengthen the system, the humanistic component come into the system so yeah. that the people who are in the system, the drivers, the actors there, they are able to deliver that humanistic care. The goal is to have like, a, it's a very, it's a global, safe, inclusive space for everybody to talk about their struggles, the struggles that encounter while delivering humanistic medicine yeah. what makes what hinders the practice of humanistic medicine people we identified because of which it was coming was because a problems faced by healthcare workers and healthcare workers are being supported by their families they the families also have the struggles obviously nobody's going to like it son is out for like two days and is not even there on eve leave the vitamin acknowledge it families are happy and if they understand the struggles if they know how to support them that's going to be easier for the healthcare providers also i mean it's easier for the healthcare providers they'll be delivering humanistic care they will not be being there they won't be rude to you they won't just shut you up similarly caregivers caregivers patients families the ones who are directly looking after a sick patient they undergo a lot of trauma and burden as well they mm -hmm. also need to figure out how to do things. It's not just dawa de di ekar A lot of emotional baggage comes with it. Mm -hmm. If they are trained and if they're equipped, 
to better handle it. So that's what holistic care means. That's what patient-centered care means, that you're giving the patient the care that they need, not the care that you think they need. Mm-hmm. And when you're thinking of it, about it from the patient's perspective, then a lot of things come into play, like their finances, their social background, their cultural background, their religious beliefs. Yeah. So you have to be respectful about all of those things. We will be launching um, training sessions, seminars, and resources, all up-to-date res- uh, um, scientifically endorsed resources on ways on how we can practice humanistic medicine from the healthcare provider's perspective, uh, family empowering the families of the healthcare providers as well, the patients raising awareness regarding their diseases, the patients' families. And then, of course, we will be uh, utilizing a small component of narrative medicine that kind of emphasizes our empathy and compassion mm-hmm. through narrative medicine. When you share your stories, if I share my story with you, it will give you perspective. It will bring up the human in you. you know? it's, it, medicine is not just about Bukhar, Dawal, Panadol, Likki Devi. It's about listening to them. It's about telling them that you have a sport. It's not people, a lot of people like, but you know, people, whenever I talk about it, people give me that look, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of look. And I'm like, Okay, stop thinking from the perspective of a healthcare provider. What if you were the patient? Are you satisfied with the care? Do not want somebody to give you care and support and do it in a good way, in a compassionate way. Kindness beats everything. Kindness does. And that's what I'm all that that's what we're championing for. Kindness in medicine. Practice medicine with kindness and compassion. And you see, and now people are going to be like, okay, but uh, we don't have enough doctors. Yeah. So they have to cover long shifts. That's the thing. There's a whole process that goes behind it. That's why health policy and management is a thing. That's what we need to figure out. How to solve these critical issues that are making the delivery of humanistic medicine, the delivery of compassionate care impossible or difficult for our doctors. That's what we need to figure out. It's a whole system. Like, I get it. What I am doing at ICHM, the International Community of Humanistic Medicine, is starting from an individual based approach. Yeah. Okay, system to fix hoga hi hoga. You cannot just wait for the system to get fixed. You have to do it on your own as well. There is something that you have to do on your own. And if you can do something, so why not? Let's just go ahead with it and do that. So it's all at this stage, it's all about sparking a conversation, making people realize, creating an awareness so that people can start talking about it. So Dr. Arfa, you also have a platform called The Walking Thoughts. And I know that you have a distinction also in English language in A-level. So that's really amazing. What is the platform Walking Thoughts about and what has your experience been like? So uh, Walking Thoughts is this um, virtual, online virtual startup, a literary startup and I started that in 2018 when I was in third year of med school so I told you initially that I had English language in my yeah in in levels and like you mentioned I had a distinction in it so I was like okay I had it but what's the use of it in my medicine degree right what am I doing with it because my belief has always been that okay if I have or a knowledge set of knowledge how am I making use of that um, am I passing it on to someone? How, how am I utilizing it? Mm-hmm. So during med school only, you know, I would see that a lot of our teachers, professors, lecturers, they were all, they were all so, you know, knowledgeable and skilled mm-hmm. and so amazing at what they did. We lacked the confidence to speak in English during presentations, seminars. Mm-hmm. And that made me sad because I was like, they're so talented and mm-hmm. they have so much knowledge and they're subject experts. Mm-hmm. But just because they can't communicate mm-hmm. in a language that is not even their mother tongue, that doesn't seem fair. Then I had also observed that there were a lot of women, uh, a lot of females who were stay-at-home moms struggling with issues of self-esteem and had low confidence only because they can't speak in English. I decided that okay, I'm going to start as start spoken English classes and online. And this was like well before COVID. So Zoom, yeah. nobody had heard of. I discovered Zoom. Some of my earliest students were, there was this one pediatric resident at one of the private tertiary care hospitals in Karachi. He was there. Then there was some uh, other people as well as girl who was uh, suffering from an autoimmune disease. I had these few people who were one of my few students. So that's how it started. Mm. And since then, Alhamdulillah, it's been going really well. Mm. In fact, this uh, autoimmune student that I was telling you about, she is, uh, I think, one of the people who have like really developed a bond with. And it really, that was something that told me that walking thoughts must go on. So, yeah. you know, it was, she was obviously it was an autoimmune disease. So, you know, yeah. she couldn't go out of the house much. She was always in a very protected mm. environment. So these uh, classes were, were like therapy for her. She was like, yeah. I enjoy that because we, I used to teach her creative writing. It was so much fun for her. So uh, two years after that, she reached 
out and she told me that she started her own plat- online platform and she was teaching other kids now. And that wow. made me so happy because I was like, this is exactly why I started it. Um, you know, that's how it started. And I've had whole cohorts of uh, students where especially healthcare, profess- uh, healthcare professionals mm-hmm. whom I have been teaching spoken English to. And the good, like, you know, over the years, I developed the whole course myself mm-hmm. and I innovated, I found out what the needs of my students yeah. were. And the kind of courses that we have is like we do role playing based on what the student's educational background is and what their professional uh, background is as well. For example, for a doctor, the role playing that we'll have will be, you know, you're delivering a presentation or you're having a talk with a, with a patient who only speaks in English or with your boss or someone who's written from abroad. Yeah. Uh, if it's an an event manager they're having a discussion with the client so you know we reenacted we had role plays of those kind which were very relevant to the students background so it was very customized for them. it wasn't like one set fits all one size fits all and it wasn't like it's not, not been like that the articles that we would be reading were all focused towards something that you know, helps them learn something whether it's a mental health issue it's critical creative thinking anything that would make them think about things you know it's not just abc they're just read a story no there's there's some element of intellectual stimulation world behind it that's how I design I've designed my classes and I think the response has been great I mean my uh, students have been doing well they've really improved they've done well and a lot of them have been healthcare professionals only whom I have been teaching so uh, that's how it started and those were the services we were offering and then of course I got other teachers on board who were giving classes for OET and IELTS and all of those and now we've also delved into writing personal statements, both for U.S. Assembly uh, applicants, you know, for universities world over. Wow. So again, narrative medicine had a huge role to play with for writing yeah. these personal statements because I I was so into narrative medicine. My friends approached me to help them with their personal statements. I started writing it and all, and it gradually became a very successful thing. Yeah. So you know, there is a whole. People really ask me that how do you, you haven't applied for the step, but you're writing personal statements. I'm also I also uh, coach people for the match interviews. Mm-hmm. Like how do you do that? I was like because I've invested time and into learning all of those. You know, mm-hmm. attending webinars, reading up on it, getting as much information as I can, just like I would have done if I were applying myself. Yeah. And because of course, it's 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 like if I feel like if I have a skill set, whether it's um, writing or you know helping with interviews or anything, then I just you know polished it, and then that's what I'm giving back to uh whoever wants it so uh writing a personal statement is like ghost writing you need to be at the highest self of empathy yeah. put yourself in another person's shoes so i usually give my not usually i always give my clients like a big set of questions a huge questionnaire that they have to answer and they usually their own sweet time in getting back to me because they're like it's not so we have to think so uh-huh. it's it, it, it's like that you have to there's a lot of thinking and critical thinking mm-hmm. and empathy involved uh last season i was burnt out i was writing so many personal statements i i, I had reached my emotional burnout because yeah. i was like this is getting too much but it was fun you get to learn a lot and obviously we take good care of the fact that you know the client's confidentiality is maintained that's why I don't give out samples to anyone if anybody asks for a sample I'm like you can either look at the reviews that I have or you can look at my own handwriting but I won't be able to give you any sample because you know we sign a clause with the clients that mm-hmm. all information you share with us would be very confidential because yes. of course there are people sharing your life their life story yeah. very personal things that motivated them yeah. to get into personal statements so to get into yeah. medicine sorry so yes, yeah. yeah, so the personal statement things have been going on, and now since this match season is back up again, we're looking at a very busy season ahead. I'm sure it's very difficult. I mean, people struggle with writing only their personal statement. It's utilizing your skill and helping others through your skill. I think it's very important to identify the skills that you have as well, because a lot of people are very talented. They have a lot of skills, but they don't know how to use them to help others or to start something of their own. Yeah, that it's actually it actually is helping people because yeah. a lot of my clients did match. You know they received really great good feedback from their mentors and attendees who they showed the personal statements to had a pre-match uh for someone who you know would helped with interview preparation also and everything so you know it's really good to see that you know it, it's happening and uh you know it, 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 when you see it manifesting like that yeah. then it really makes you feel really happy and then you're like you know uh 
for them it's such a big deal so uh, it's like shared happiness across the screen i think that is bringing us towards the end of our conversation but before we end this do you have any advice for the people who are watching this i know everybody says that believe in yourself i'm just going to say that be kind to your be kind to the people around you invest in yourself and when i say invest in yourself i don't necessarily mean ke you're uh, investing in good clothes or food or something like that those things are important of course they are but invest in yourself in the sense that uh, learn who you are invest time in introspection figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are and then pick and choose whichever field you have to because that is very important these are things you'll be doing for the rest of your life know what your skill set skill set is it's not necessary that if you're if you're an artist you're good at art you can't make use of that you can as long as your intention is right things are going to find a way things are going to find a way yeah. when i say invest in yourself i also mean that do not be unkind to other people because it comes back yeah and you you're unkind to other people you are you know you you are disrespectful to other people you're actually they will pass through it but it's going to come back to you it just happens that it just that's just how life manifests itself as healthcare professionals we are dealing with life and death we see life and death nobody should value life and death more than us in the same hospital we pass in a baby is being born mm-hmm. often is also being passed so the value of life your own life and the lives of those around you is something that you should always keep yeah. in mind yeah. and getting into medicine is not about just saving lives or just getting into com- competitive residencies or just doing things for the sake of it enjoy every moment of it because uh, it it is possible when you are, when you become when you get to that point where you are somebody's senior please don't do things like uh, we had tough times so you will also no make create ease for other people help them prosper help them get to that point and make the system better the system will become better when you will become better yes. and that again everything stems from empathy you cannot place yourself you cannot solve a problem unless you really know what it is like to be in there right so yes my final word which is be be kind to yourself and be kind to the people around you and be kind to your patients do not be the kind of doctor who just writes down prescriptions and gives them make sure that when your patient goes out of your walks out of your door they do so with a smile and make sure that when you graduate as medical doctors and when you walk out of your clinic you do so with a heart that is kind and not hard definitely my dada was a doctor so he used to say that when the patient walks into your room half of his disease should be treated just by the way you talk to that Absolutely. patient and the other half you can obviously do with medicines you have just summarized the entire essence and core crux of what humanistic medicine is about honestly i had a lot of fun having this conversation with you and it was so insightful and i learned so much through this conversation because this is something that people don't usually talk about very few people even know about all of this and thank you so much for coming and i hope that we can have you again on the podcast inshallah and talk more about humanistic medicine hopefully, hopefully when humanistic medicine is not that that of little of a baby yeah. and when we have we have done more with students watching you know they can subscribe to the page and join the facebook community there's lots lined up for you lots packed up for you pleasure talking to you and i'm and i'm so glad we got to have this conversation it was very refreshing to be talking about something that is you know like so close to your heart also and then also which is so much more needed especially yeah. in the world that we're living in now thank you so much it was an amazing conversation thank you so much